Hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. If we have not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I am delighted to be the recipient of a birthday gift from one of you. Uh, some new Western wear uh, that for a cowboy church. It's, Hawaii is as far west as one can go. So uh, I am delighted to be the teaching pastor here. And I would like to just personally welcome a couple of my relatives that surprised me today. What a wonderful day. My uncle uh, Ken and his daughter, my cousin Amy, are with us. They're... Uh, They were wearing disguises as they came in. I said, no, I think they like me enough here. You could just kind of come as you are. So please, not too many questions about my life prior to that as they'll tell you all kinds of stories. And I, I don't think I sh you should believe a word of them. So uh, if you are visiting with us, welcome. We're really glad you're here. And you know, as James says, on site or online, we hope there's three things you experience every week, whether this is your first time here or you've been here for 50 years which I can't imagine, because we've only been open for three. So uh, we always hope that you experience the fellowship. This really, you could tell there's, this is like stepping into kind of a goofy family reunion. And I hope you have that feeling, as I did the very first time I met this small group of people. I went, yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fit in here okay. Because the Holy Spirit of God is with these people. And I, 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 know, I know from watching online for a few weeks when I was in quarantine, you can actually sense that here. Uh, it's a lot more fun in, perp uh, in person. Uh, I also hope that you experience uh, authentic worship. You know, worship is something that you're responsible really for doing on your own. But it's so much easier to do, I don't know why, when we get together. Amen? And it's also so much easier to do when we're led by the ministers of the gospel who disguise themselves as the best country musicians this side of Nashville. So, And finally, you now must endure me, which is what, well, the only reason I'm here is my stunning good looks and the fact that we go verse by verse. But don't laugh too hard at that. Dad always said I had a face for radio anyway. I'm still recovering from that. We go verse by verse through God's Word. If there was anything else that was alive and living that could teach you, I might consider it. If there's anything else that was authored by the very creator and author of your soul and life and eternity, I might consider it. But there isn't, and this is. And so we open God's Word, we go verse by verse, and we have been in a very interesting study of a little book called Jonah. And we're going to finish that up today with some final thoughts. I hope, like me, that you have encountered Jonah is a, a powerful little book. You know, it really is. It's only three pages, and I have this giant type size so that I can see it while I'm up here. In your Bibles, it might only be two, but there's some real powerful lessons. It, it, because it's so short, it won't take me too long to recap this. God said to Jonah, go preach to Nineveh. Jonah said no, and he went in the opposite direction, completely disobeyed God. This one chart tells you everything. You know, this picture would have represented the known world to a Middle Easterner at that time. And instead of going from the port of Joppa to Nineveh, which is where he was called, he got on a boat and went to the opposite side of the world, right? This is where he was headed. And of course, the, the ship he was on, it met a, fur a furious storm. And uh, Jonah didn't care. He was actually asleep in the bottom of the boat. And so the sailors are freaking out. It's a Greek term. They, they, they woke him up. They woke him up, and they cast lots, and they said, we know that you're responsible for this. What have you done? And he says, I, I don't know. I'm running away from God. Said, Throw me into the sea, and, and you'll be fine. Which kind of sounds noble, except he, he is choosing to die rather than obey God bad idea, because in the end, you're going to do both, die and obey God, right? So they throw him overboard, they're saved, and these pagan sailors, they worship God, and Jonah, well, he doesn't die. God's not done with him. He has a special fish that has been created for this unique occasion, the God Jonah fish. Don't say that fast. It doesn't sound, it sounds like a swear word. Um, and, and this fish keeps Jonah safe delivering him from the inside of the belly of that fish, Jonah prays. And he says, I'm, you know, he doesn't say, I'm sorry. He says this weird kind of prayer. He says, okay, I get it. You're bigger than me. And I will obey you. And by obeying you, I get to receive your grace and others don't. And that's all true. And so on that 
The fish vomits Jonah onto dry land. God gives him a do-over. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people in this world I wish I could have do-over with. God is always willing to give you a do-over. He's big enough and his grace is large enough and you could just ask him today. And I, like, like the song said, what have I ever done? I have blown it so much. And he says, Let's, how about we do a do-over? That's not an endorsement of what you did to get here, but it's an, hey, let's start again. Jonah got one of those. Beautiful thing, isn't it? And so God says, go to Nineveh. And he says, okay, I will. Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he obeys God. He tells the Ninevites in a really oddly short sermon. It's only five Hebrew words he tells them. Forty days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's his sermon. Doesn't matter. The power of God was behind it. And half a million Ninevites repented. Even the cows repented. I don't know what that means. I'd love to have tried a hamburger after that. It probably would have tasted a little better. I don't know. But God relents from destroying the city of Nineveh. And Jonah is furious. You would think he'd be happy. You would think that he would be okay. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, it tells us, But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And, you know, this is the answer why he ran, why he disobeyed God, but it's not a good answer, is it? You know what? I I know enough about you that I know that you sending me to Nineveh might have caused them to repent, and I don't want them to repent. I hate those guys. You know, someone pointed out that maybe he hated them for what they would do in the future. That's interesting, because he's a prophet. He might have seen it. doesn't matter. He still was willing to die rather than to act as a servant of God to prevent the annihilation of half a million people. This is not a good dude. So he sees them repent. He becomes distraught. You heard him saying. And, um, and then he goes out. God asks him a question. He says, do you have any right to be angry? Do you really? And that doesn't sink in because it's too general. So God kind of plans a little lesson for him. And Jonah goes out and he sits by east of the city, which is, I I hate to tell you this, just kind of sick. He's hoping they'll repent of their repentance. Does that make sense? It's like if someone has had a demon cast out of them, and then a demon comes back, you could say they've been repossessed, right? This is what he's hoping will happen to the Ninevites. And he's sitting there watching. That that wasn't wasn't a spirit joke or anything like that. He's, he's sitting outside the city watching to see, I'm going to wait these 40 days just in case they repent of their repentance. Then I can get to see them wiped out. This is not a healthy place for him emotionally or mentally or spiritually. Amen? Okay. So God decides as he's sitting there, he's going to perform an object lesson on Jonah. i tell you what, Jonah, I'm not getting through to you on the big picture here. So while you're camped there, I'm going to provide a vine. Overnight, a vine springs up that provides shelter, from the wind and the dust and shade. And Jonah likes the vine. He actually, it's the only time in the book we find out Jonah was happy. He was happy about the vine. Maybe he was happy only because it brought him comfort. Hmm? I don't know. So then God destroys the vine the next day. He allows a cancer in the form of a worm to destroy the vine. And Jonah's furious about that. And he says, you know what? I'm so mad that this vine is gone. Just take my life now. This guy's got a death wish. And so God asks him the same question, only this time it's getting more specific. Do you have any right to be angry about the vine? You didn't create this vine. You don't create vines. You know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. I gave you this vine, I took it away. How are you finding yourself angry about the vine? And Jonah says, I am. I'm angry enough to die. And sadly, those are the last words we hear from Jonah. But of course, the last words in the book we hear from God. And they are this. Jonah chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. But the Lord said, 
you've been concerned about this vine, but you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And this is, this is interesting. Now, real quick, the, the Hebrew reference to the people that can't tell their right hand from their left, it doesn't mean they're Washington politicians. It, <laughs> it actually is a term of, it is a term of innocence, cognitive innocence. And it's used to describe infants and little children. Do you remember a time when you didn't know your right hand from your left? Do you remember a time when you had to learn to tie your shoes? This is what they're saying is we're going back to is a time of cognitive innocence. And so if there's 120,000 little kids and infants there that aren't even aware of which hand is right and which hand is left, we can assume there's about a half million people. Fair enough? And he says, you're more worried about a vine than half a million people. Aren't vines, aren't people more important than vines? And, you know, and this, these questions God's asking, ostensibly he's asking them to Jonah, but I hope you hear, because of the way the book is constructed, that he might be asking them to you. Aren't people more important than vines? Are you so concerned about the shade and comfort that you've lost that you've lost God's concern for the lost? And I, man, I don't mean to be preachy about that. That is convicting for me as well. So we go back and we look, take a big picture look at the book of Jonah and we try and find some answers. One of the places we started was by looking for other places in the Bible that told us about Jonah. Uh, just a rule that I use is that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So we found an Old Testament verse that told us some things about Jonah. I'll just show it to you. It's not that important. It's from 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel. By the way, since this is the book of Kings, the he there is King Jeroboam II. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebohamoth to the Sea of Arabah in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Heifer. And we looked into a little bit about what that prophecy meant, but it's really not as important to us now as it was. This was confirmation outside the book of Jonah that Jonah was indeed an Old Testament prophet, confirmed about the time and confirmed at his existence there. There's another reference. There's actually two. There's another reference in the, Old Test- in the New Testament to Jonah. And it was spoken by Jesus himself. And we haven't touched it yet. And so for a concluding message on our thoughts, our final thoughts on Jonah, who better to offer us commentary than Jesus himself? From the book of Matthew, chapter 12, beginning in verse 38. Some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher... We want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord. And the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And so uh, I hope that you've heard this before, the sign of Jonah. It's a relatively short book, Jonah. But because this is where we're going today, I wanted to take a look at the sign of Jonah. And that's the title of today's message as we conclude. What is the sign of Jonah? Well, You know, honestly, first of all, I'm a little stunned that Jesus wants to associate himself with Jonah. Um, Jonah is not a great prophet. I'm sorry, I know that disappoints you. If the only thing you knew about Jonah was the kids' pageant that just took you through chapters 1, 2, and 3, this might be a disappointment to you, but he's not going to show up in Hebrews 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. He's not. And, And we don't need to bash him. Because all that tells us is that he's a sinner like me and like some of you (laughs) who've come to realize that you are, right? So let's not bash Jonah, but let's consider for a moment 
that this is not a good guy. His actions in this book are not worth emulating. So maybe this is a cautionary tale for us. And maybe as sinners ourselves, we can look at ways to avoid that. And so with that in mind, what did Jesus tell us? Let's dig into that. Now, it begins in an interesting setting. Verse 38 tells us that this happened when he was being questioned by the, the Pharisees and teachers of the law. These are not good people either, okay? These are people that opposed Jesus, that plotted to kill Jesus and discredit Jesus, okay? And they then, verse 38, then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. This, this verse always makes me laugh for a couple of reasons. First of all, what, what would have done it for him? Like a card trick, right? I mean, ser- seriously, what did they want to see? Some form of levitation? I've, I've always wondered if, what would have, oh, well, that's it. But second of all, I think the, the more humorous thing is where had they been? For three years walking all around this region, Jesus has performed miracles, literal miracles, that they either could have seen themselves or heard firsthand testimony from someone. How did they miss it? I've, you know, it's funny. I, I looked up a few of these and just for a list. First, Jesus demonstrated his power over nature. He changed water into wine. <laughs> Some of you are still trying that trick. Um, <laughs> You can do it if you're willing to spend years watching the grapes absorb the water and then making it yourself. He produced a great cache of fish in, in the Sea of Galilee, which a lot of people would have seen. He caused a fig tree to wither. Maybe he didn't like figs. He caused and then calmed a furious storm on the Sea of Galilee. And here's one. that How did you miss this? He fed on two separate occasions thousands of people with a small number of starting food, right? Five loaves, two fish feeds 5,000. You can't grab one of those 5,000 and hear about this? See, and those are just the demonstrations of our nature. Think of the times Jesus healed people, right? Over a dozen people of just what we'll call various ailments, right? Some guy's got a bad back, Jesus heals him. Some guy's got a withered hand, Jesus heals him. Over a dozen times. But there's some specific times when Jesus peeled. He loved to restore sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, and, and speech to the mute. He did that too many times. He freed at least five, by my count, maybe more, people from demon possession. And he raised three people from the dead. The widow's son in Nain, which you can read about in, John chapter, or, uh, in Luke chapter 7. The synagogue ruler's daughter, which you can read about in Matthew chapter 9. And, of course, maybe the most famous is Lazarus, his friend Lazarus, which you can read about in John chapter 11. So, you know, they're asking for a sign. Where have they been? And what would satisfy them? I think if you can kind of understand that, you'll understand why Jesus replied to him the way he did in verse 39. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And this is really interesting. Jesus recalls these people to their face, wicked and adulterous. By adulterous here, he means that they have sought after other gods. Common Old Testament imagery that that, that the people of God have made a commitment to them, and when we put anything above that commitment, any idol, our 401k, the outcome of an election, any idol we put above God is makes us part of the adulterous generation. Sorry, I'm guilty of it myself at times. This is a wicked and adulterous because maybe you don't have to do that. Maybe you just have bad motives. And that's what he says to these guys. <laughs> and, you know, but I keep thinking, you know, is it, is it always wrong to ask the Lord for a sign? No, I don't think so. I really don't. I think it is wrong for these people. See, and this is where to understand this, you have to remember who Jesus is. Jesus is the author of creation. He's the one that spoke the universe into existence. Your conscious mind is his creation. Do you understand that? Your conscious mind continues to work when you're asleep. 
your conscious mind will continue to exist when all your other senses are cut off from it. You know that now, and I promise you that will happen after every other bodily function ceases. Your conscious mind is a creation of God, and it will exist beyond your physical body. Amen? Be careful to whom you trust it. But because Jesus is the author of that, he knows what you're thinking. It kind of takes the fun out of lying to him when you pray. <laughs> and that's a, you know, it's kind of a personal thing for me. At one point, I realized I was kind of polishing the apple every time I would pray. You know, oh, we're doing fine down here. I could just use a little help. It's almost like, who are you kidding? I made your mind. I know your thoughts. And, and so... He understands when these people ask him to show them a sign, he understands that's not genuine. And he also understands that when sometimes people do ask for signs, it is genuine. So yeah, genuine seekers, God is always trying to draw them in. Right? That's what he wants. He wants to have a relationship with every conscious mind he created. And he loves every conscious mind the way a mother loves a, a, a newborn baby, actually even more than that, if such a thing could be fathomed. So, you know, what do we do with that? Well, we have to always treat every question as though it's coming from someone who sincerely is being drawn towards God, because we don't know. But the Bible does tell us once in a while, there are people whose, their, their hearts are hardened, their eyes are blinded, and so don't be too upset if Maybe somebody asks you a question and they're really not even listening to the answer. Jesus tells this parable about a man named Lazarus and a rich man, and they both die. And the, the rich man and Lazarus, I hope you've heard this parable before. The rich man wakes up and he finds himself still conscious, but apart from the presence of God. It's described as being in agony. And he begins a dialogue with a character who can speak to him named Abraham. And he wants Abraham to allow him to go back and warn his brothers so that they won't share his same fate. Luke chapter 16, verse 29. Abraham replied, well, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Verse 30. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Abraham said to him, in verse 31, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This is the generation we live in. This was the generation in the first century. Jesus Christ was executed on a Roman cross, and he was dead physically, and he was laid in a tomb, and three days later, the sign of Jonah is that he was raised unto new life. And there are people who know that, that, that that event can actually be maybe not proven, but it can be so strongly encouraged by the physical and geopolitical events that followed. It's like throwing a rock into the pond. It makes ripples, and maybe now all we can see are the ripples. But someone threw a rock in the pond... And there's some people that even hearing the voice of one raised from the dead, they're not going to be convinced. And this is what God was trying to tell us. And that's what these people are. These Pharisees and teachers of the law, they're, they're not. But you know what's funny? Jesus knows that his conversation with them is being recorded by the Holy Spirit, of course, right? And that it's going to be something that you and I 2,000 years later get to read. So for the sake and love of all humanity... He tells, he hides the sign from them even from in his words, right? No, no sign is going to be given you because you're not sincere. But there will be a sign of Jonah, the prophet Jonah. And, and I'll tell you and I'll tell for the sincere people that will read these words later. Verse 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? I compare myself to Jonah as he was dead inside the belly of a fish for three days and then came out. I'm going to be dead inside the earth in a tomb for three days and then I will come out. 
Each event is a miracle. Predicting it ahead of time is also a pretty good trick. And so that's what most of us, if I said, do you know what the sign of Jonah is? Most of us say the sign of Jonah is this. But I actually think the sign of Jonah may include something more. I'm going to humbly offer that the sign of Jonah is not just the resurrection, although that's a pretty good thing in and of itself. It's also the repentance, the repentance of a large number of people. Listen to how what goes on, how Jesus goes on after telling him. Verse 40, he says, verse 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. You you get this? The, The people of Nineveh are going at the judgment of all humanity. They're going to get to accuse that first century generation of Pharisees and teachers of the law for not believing because we believed and we got just Jonah, not the greatest prophet. You didn't believe, and one greater than Jonah, the greatest, was standing right in front of you. Amen? That's what that means. And I, I, I think it's very possible, I think it's really possible that repentance of people is also a sign of Jesus' veracity. See, these signs are to prove that he really was who he said he was, God. Coming back after being in the grave was a good sign. But another thing is the repentance of people, and not just a half a million people was a pretty good repentance. And Jonah, Jesus is saying that billions of people are going to repent, including people that you don't normally think of as in the family of God. Did you catch that? The men of Nineveh would have been a great example. So I'm proposing that the sign of Jonah, in addition to the resurrection, is the repentance in mass of people that we might not otherwise think are in the family of God. Does that make sense? You know, the entire book of Jonah follows that theme. Pagan sailors repent while he's drowning. This is a lucky evangelist. Half a million people repent with the worst five-word sermon I think I've ever heard. And the reason Jonah didn't really want to preach them is he kind of thought that they were outside the family of God. And I think Jesus is going to say to these guys, you you know, there's another sign. Something miraculous is going to happen. And by the way, didn't that happen? I mean, on the day of Pentecost, 40 days after Christ's resurrection, a brand new event is started called the church. And at first it was... Jewish converts, but it didn't take long before pagans and Gentiles joined. And that would be my lineage at that time. Would have probably gone back to some, some I don't know, we were probably destroying temples or something, my ancestors at that time. My lineage is not that of Abraham. And the kingdom of heaven was opened to me. It's a beautiful thing. There's a parallel verse that describes this. It's in Luke chapter 11. Let me read it to you. A lot of parallel verses in the Bible that tell the same thing. It's Luke's telling of this same encounter. He says, as the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign. But none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Okay? But then listen to what comes next in this version. The queen of the south will rise... At the, at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. And the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment of this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. You get this? The queen of the south, outsider. The men of Nineveh, outsiders. Outsiders are going to repent and come to know Jesus. Now, It could be that this was just a way to embarrass that generation of Israel's leaders, and they had a lot to be embarrassed about in the first century. But I think the results that happen of Jesus' resurrection caused me to consider that that was one of the massive events, a massive sign to the world. Does that make sense? It's repentance. Well, if if you are willing to accept that, that that was a sign of Jonah, what does that mean? Does that mean anything to us? Well, a couple of things. First of all, as a church, we must never, never 
preach any watered-down, spiritualized message of resurrection. Physical, bodily resurrection of this man Jesus happened. And churches, denominations that have cut themselves off from that fact are sawing off the branch on which they sit. Eventually, any power they have over humanity is totally wiped out. And this is something that, it sounds really contentious, and it's just logic. The most dreaded thing that will happen to each of us is something the insurance companies have been making money on for years. That is that the death rate is one per person. Yeah, I'm, one of these days I'm going to die. And it is the most dreaded event in everyone's life. If, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't real, what hope do I have? See, and the Bible says this too. The Bible doubles down on this fact and this sentiment when it says in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If for only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Guys, what this means without too much emotive rhetoric here if there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ, nothing matters. Our loved ones which have preceded us in death are just gone. And we're living out a few more days until we're gone too. But the only thing that makes that worse is that we've deluded ourselves into some fantasy. That's what this verse says. Did you ever realize the Bible says if that didn't really happen, you're all fools. Really, I mean, this is just, it's like a social club at that point. And, and I, see, this is why in the last few weeks, in the last few days, I, I, I mean, I care about what goes on with the laws and the government. I really do. I care about it. And, and I, I don't want to discourage any of you for working in those realms to make the world a better place. But apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ... It doesn't matter who's in the White House, who's in the dog house, who's in the hen house, or who's in the outhouse. <laughs> it doesn't. Think about it for 10 minutes and you will come to the same conclusion. And that's why that resurrection is so important. It's, it's, it's the source of all hope. But to me, at least as an American living in this century, I also think that it gives me hope that the repentance of people that we consider to be outside the family of God is also a sign of Jonah and something very possible. I'm simply going to suggest that countries get better right after their citizens do. And there's 330 million Americans. I just don't know how many of them know they need a Savior. I just don't know. I think it needs to be a larger number, right? Right? Garbage in, garbage out is what the computer programs used to teach me. You can have all the fancy coding on the fastest computer. If you put unreliable data in, you get unreliable conclusions out. If our nation is made up of people that don't have some respect for basic spiritual truths, I don't care what government we've got. And by the way, that's not just me. Listen to what John Adams said about this. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Now, let that sink in for a minute. Work all you want on civic causes. What the world needs is more Christians. It needs more people to believe in the teaching of Jesus Christ and the hope of the resurrection. Because that's true. And the biggest tragedy that could ever happen is not that we lose the government. It's that 330 million people walk headlong into a Christless eternity. And we get to be the ones that stop that. That's our calling. That's our job. And it, you know what? It might take a while. It took us 245 years to get into this mess. It might take us four or five to get out of it power of God is what, you know, I don't know how fast he wants to work, 
But you know what? If it's my kids that work towards this or my grandkids that work towards this, I'm okay with that as long as we're working towards this. Save souls and you win every time. And if you don't fix that problem, it doesn't matter who's captain of the Titanic while you're rearranging the deck chairs. It doesn't. I'm sorry. And if we do solve that problem, the other problems take care of themselves. So let's do what Jesus called us to do. Preach Christ and make disciples. Let's do that. And that's how we will change our nation. And I'm not saying don't do all the other things you want to do, but let's make sure we do that first. Amen? Well, whatever happened to Jonah? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I really wish I could tell you definitively. Because the last we saw Jonah, it was not good. He was wanting to die. He was pouting. Have you ever pouted before? Ever lied about not pouting before? <laughs> it's a massive lesson for us. That was for Jonah. I, I happen to think Jonah is okay. I really do. I think he came around. I can't prove it to you, but there is a tomb of Jonah, the Nabayonis. Two weeks ago, we talked about it, if you want to watch that sermon. And what it tells me is they wouldn't have done that had he not maybe stayed around, come around, and help the Ninevites understand a little bit more about God. That tomb, Nabayonis, is in Mosul, northern Iraq. And that's the, the original site of Nineveh. So some physical evidence tells me that. Also some biblical evidence. I mean, somebody had to write the book of Jonah. And it was either him or his wife. Someone who had to know a lot of details. But I think the most compelling evidence for me is throughout this book, time and time again, God Never let Jonah go. He has a way of doing that. For 28 years with me. And eventually, you get into a fight with God, and God wins. And I think ultimately, God's overwhelming grace and love towards Jonah won him over. I I'm willing to predict that, even though the book doesn't tell us that. The book does tell us this massive lesson. Are you okay with people you hate being loved by God? I'll bet you could each imagine someone right now that you dislike. Many of you, it would be a figure in Washington. Are you okay with the fact that God loves that person so much that he died for them? And if he calls you to preach to them, you grit your teeth and you do it just like Jonah did. That's the lesson of Jonah. <laughs> he may, you know, I've got Ninevites in my life. Someone in my neighborhood, we've got a particularly grumpy neighbor. It's a Ninevite. God's calling the Ninevites. Maybe somebody I hadn't thought of would ever come to know Jesus. Maybe somebody I kind of wish wouldn't because I'm a rat. But the Lord does. And if he calls me to preach to the Ninevites, and if he calls you to preach to the Ninevites in your life, be his servant. Help him do a work in their hearts. And that begins with a work in our hearts. Amen? And thus concludes the book of Jonah. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord. And the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Let's pray. Lord, will you help us to see the world through your perspective, not the narrow little focus of our own time and place and politics, but the big perspective of eternal beings that walk around in these bodies. Will you help us be the absolute best emissaries of you to everyone who needs you, especially the Ninevites in my life? God, you, you're going to have to begin by changing my heart even more, filling me with your Holy Spirit and allowing me, instead of building fortresses around what I believe, building bridges to the lost. Jesus, as I repent and ask for your help, please now 
Fill our land with a hunger for you. Fill this church and those like it that speak the truth of you, that more would know you and come to know there is indeed a God, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen.